A few weeks back, I put up a question on the community tab, and I asked, what applications do you use that you just absolutely couldn't live without? And that question kind of got me thinking about features of Linux that I just couldn't live without. And there are a few of them. So what I thought I'd do today is go through a few things on Linux that just have completely changed the way I use the operating system. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the first one on the list is scratch pads. Now, if you've followed the channel for any amount of time, you'll know that I am a big fan of scratch pads. Now, I'm sure there's some small portion of you out there wondering, Matt, what the hell is a scratch pad? And the answer to that question is, oh, they're so cool. Let me show you. So here we are just on my desktop. You're seeing Audacity right now, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we could go to a different workspace. And let's just say we have a whole bunch of stuff open up here. We just have some terminals. We have a instance of Firefox, which we can move. We can do what we're just going about our day doing stuff on our desktop. And let's just say I need to get to a terminal. Now, I could open up another terminal, but as you see, the screen's kind of getting a little bit crowded. And, I mean, you can't do much with the, the size of window uh, without, you know, having to scroll up or something. So let's say I need another terminal. I could hit my key binding here. And I get another terminal. That is a scratch pad. Now, basically, what this is, is a application that lives on a hidden desktop. Or a hidden workspace, if you will, or a hidden tag in the case of DWM. It means that you can hit, hit a key binding. And let's just run HTOP here. And we have HTOP running. I can hit the key binding again, and it goes away. And I'm like, where did it go? Did it go to another workspace? Did it go to another tag? No, it's still there. It's just you get the do the key binding, and it comes back. You can literally do that with anything in the terminal. Uh, so I have a couple terminals here. I also have Pulse Mixer. I have uh, my music player tagged to a, a scratch pad. And a couple other things. I have Ranger. I have uh, Git Kraken. I have uh, Bitwarden. All these things are set to open up in a, a scratch pad so that I can open them up on any workspace and they just pop up in a floating window over whatever I'm doing. That's a scratch pad. And I use this constantly. If they went away, I couldn't use my computer happily. I just could I mean, I probably would get used to it after a while, but I wouldn't be as satisfied using Linux as I am right now. This is one thing that literally changed my life when I started using them because it made me more efficient. It's gotten so bad that when I come across a window manager or a desktop environment that doesn't have them built in, I get kind of mad at it. Like, I, I, like, why? Why don't you have this built in? Now, if you're wanting these things and you don't have, you're not using a window manager or a desktop environment that has them built in, you can use something like Tilda, which is a, is a terminal emulator that can function as a scratch pad. I'll leave a link to that in the video description below. Or you can do something like, I think it's called like T-Flop or T-Drop or something. I'm not exactly sure what it's called. I'll have to look that up as well. I'll try to leave a, a link in the video description for that as well. But that is a program that actually creates scratch pads and can be used with any window manager. So if you want to try out scratch pads but they're not built in, this is DWM. DWM does not have them built in by default. You have to patch that in. But you can get them. There's three or four different scratch pad patches that you can use. i3 has them built in by default. I think you can get them in Qtile. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Xmonad is, you can use those in Xmonad if you can figure out Haskell and how to get them, you know, set up in Haskell. I'm not sure about Awesome Window Manager. Uh, I think they don't have it or it doesn't have it, but I'm not, I couldn't say that for sure. So that's the first one, uh, item on the list. The next item on the list is key cords and key bindings. Now, I'm combining these really because they're basically the same thing. And honestly, this is mostly just about key bindings. Key cords are just kind of uh, the cherry on top of the, the, the cake or whatever. It's just, you know, key cords are cool and I like them a lot and I like to talk about them. But let's just focus on key bindings. If you're new to Linux and you're coming from like Windows or Mac OS, there's a good chance that you have been using the keyboard and the mouse as your main input devices combined. Like you're always using them in conjunction with each other. And you can do that in Linux as well. Obviously, it's the same type of thing. 
But one of the things that makes Linux awesome is that a lot of desktop environments and window managers are meant to be used primarily with the keyboard. And what's great about that is that it means you don't have to move your hands back and forth between both input devices. And this isn't new. Windows has lots of key bindings. Mac OS has key bindings. So it's not like Linux is exclusive in this party. But I feel that Linux does a great job of promoting keyboard use and customizability. A lot of things, like in Windows, I wouldn't even know how about how you would go about customizing a key binding in Windows, if it's even possible. Like, but in Linux, you can go through and set the key bindings to whatever you want. If you're in your window manager, you do it from a config file. If you're in KDE, you do it from the application settings. If you're in, here's how pivotal key bindings are to Linux. You can even change key bindings in GNOME, and those people don't let you customize crap. You know, so key bindings are essential to Linux, and if you learn them, they'll change the way you use your operating system because it will allow you to open up applications, move applications, and do a ton of different functions without your fingers ever leaving the keyboard. Now, where this gets interesting is with key cords. Now, key cords aren't something that will exist on every single desktop environment or window manager, unfortunately. Sadly, there's only certain programs and certain window managers that have them built in. Uh, if you're using something like SXHKD, which is a hotkey daemon, meaning it runs in the background and listens for input from the keyboard to do certain things. And if you use that, then you can also use key cords in whatever window manager or desktop environment you're using as long as SXHKD is running. So here's what's cool about key cords. There are anywhere from 70 to 108, 109 keys on a keyboard, depending on what size keyboard you're using. Maybe a little bit more, maybe a little less, depending on if you have macro keys or a keypad or if you have if your keyboard doesn't have function keys, whatever. It's in that range. The point is, is that the number of keys you have is a finite number. You don't have just an unlimited number of keys that you can do. And there's only four modifier keys that you can use in, in conjunction with the other keys on the keyboard. There's Control, there's Super, there's Alt, and there's Shift. And... Those are the four modifier keys that you can use, and Shift is not really a modifier key. It can be used in conjunction with other modifier keys. It usually cannot be used on its own because that just means you're typing in a capital letter. The exception to that is Vim, uh, where things are always a little weirder than normal. But the, the, the point is, eventually, if you get big into key bindings, you're going to run out of possible combinations. Or... The combinations will be, get so weird that they'll be hard to remember. Key chords solve that problem by allowing you to create specialized key combinations. So, for example, I have a key chord set up in SXHKD in my DWM setup and in all my window managers that use SXHKD. I can do Super G, and then after that, I can do any number of... So I, I do Super G, let the, those keys up, and then whatever key I press after that is going to do a certain action. For example, if I hit C, my clipboard manager will come up. If I do Super G and then S, my search script will come up. Super Shift plus A, my config manager will come up. Super Shift plus E, emojis, and so on and so forth. They're all tied to Super G. And then one key after that. I also have a key binding for launching certain applications. So for example, I can go through and launch Nitrogen with a key binding or a key cord. I can write Telegram or LibreOffice or GIMP or, and all these things are tied to another key binding. Uh, I have a key, a key cord set up to visit my most visited websites. So for example, I can do Control F and then A and that'll take me to Reddit. I can do Control F and then uh, D, it'll take me to The Verge. I mean, that's enough examples, but the point is, is if I had to go through and create one key binding for each of those separate things, I'd really eventually run out of key bindings. Or, like I said, that'd be so weird that'd be hard to remember. This way, they're all tied to one certain key binding, and then a letter after that that's associated with something that I can remember. That's really cool. That's why key chords are awesome. And it's also why when I can't use them, I get a little unhappy with my Linux system because it just makes me depressed and makes me want to run back to whatever desktop environment or window manager I was using that does have them. So 
that's key chords and key bindings. The next one on the list is a little bit more of a general thing. Um, to me, the pinnacle of Linux success is using a tiling window manager. It's my, it's what I graduated to from using Plasma and I find every time I go back to a, fl a floating window manager like Plasma or Gnome or whatever, I get unhappy because I don't like it nearly as much because things get lost. Uh, things get piled on top of each other. It's just a mess. So for me, using a tiling window manager really changed the way I use Linux because before I used a tiling window manager, my first tiling window manager was i3. Before that, I was fine with KDE. I had no problems. I was really good with control tab or whatever it was to navigate through windows. And I was just used to using one workspace. Now, those of you who've been watching the channel for any amount of time, you'll know that the idea of me using just one workspace is just kind of probably shocking to you because everybody knows I use a ton of workspaces. Right now I'm using one, two, three, four, five on this monitor and four on this monitor. And that's actually kind of low. Uh, usually I use a few more than that, but I'm sure I'll get there eventually this evening. The point is, once I started using a tiling window manager, I started using workspaces or tags in this case much more. And that allowed me to spread out my work into a more efficient manner. It means that every tag or workspace has its purpose. Like on this monitor here that I'm facing, on tag one, I always have my to-do list and I always have them with me. That's the way it always is. I know where those things are all the time. If I was in a floating window manager, I'd have to go hurt hunting for those things all the time because I always want those things front and center in a certain place where I can find them. Workspace 6 or Tag 6 on both monitors is always reserved for Audacity and OBS. I, that's why I, when I know I need to change a scene or I need to make sure I'm recording something, I know where that is. Uh, 9 on those workspace is Discord. 9 on this workspace is always my mail. So that is the way I use workspaces and that didn't come about until I started using Tiling Window Managers. And I don't know what it is about Tiling Window Managers that really got me using workspaces more, but I think it's because of the necessity of using full screen apps. When you spawn a window, it takes up the whole screen. Now you might have gaps or whatever, but it takes up the whole desktop. And if you spawn another one, you always have your whole desktop used. And the as you saw earlier when I cut to the desktop, the more windows you have on a certain tag, the more cramped things get. They spawn in equal proportion to each other, but eventually your windows get so small they become unusable. So that's why I started using workspaces. And I like that. It has made me more efficient. And I think that for a lot of people, it will make them more efficient. So I always encourage people to give Tiling Window Manager a try. Now, some people just prefer something like KDE or GNOME. It's perfectly fine. It's it's not as if you can't be efficient doing that thing. You you've just you've established your workflow there, and there's nothing wrong with sticking to it. But for some people, they, I think that they can move away from that and into tiling window managers, tiling window managers, and find that they would be even more uh, efficient and more productive than they are or they expected to be. The next one on the list is the nerdiest. Well, it's almost the nerdiest one on the list, but it's probably also the most superficial of the list. Everyone knows that I like to rice things, I, that I like to change the themes of my window managers a lot, that I go through and change the colors of everything five times a week. And it's not that often, but it feels like that sometimes. So it shouldn't surprise you that I also like to theme my browser. So the, the thing about like the huge number of Chrome-based browsers is that they're all kind of the same when it comes to customizability. Vivaldi probably comes the closest in terms of actually being able to be customized a lot. But again, you have to live within the, within the settings that Vivaldi gives you. And things like Brave, they're not customizable really at all. I mean, sure, you can have themes, but you're not changing that UI at all. Uh, same thing with Chromium or all those things. They're all basically the same. The thing about Firefox is that they allow you to change the CSS that dictates the layout of the browser itself. So I can create something like this and it can be awesome. So I have my bookmarks along the side. I have the tabs and the address bar all in one row. And that's the way I set up my browser. Now, mostly this is just for looks like it, it looks cool. That's why I did it. I can't proclaim that I did this because I'm some kind of a genius when it comes to efficiency or I needed to change this in order to be productive in the in the browser. 
That's not the case. I did it because it looks cool. However, it actually is functional and it does increase my productivity. Quite, oh, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but at least somewhat because I was always going through and having to enable the bookmarks bar because I hate the double in the default Firefox setup. You always have your bar and then your tabs and then you have your uh, your bookmarks down here and I hate that three level thing it, it always bothered me and it so I always disabled the bookmarks bar so I was always having to hit control shift B in order to get that to come up or I had to open up a new tab because it's by default it's now hidden except for when there's a new tab so while I would say that this thing is mostly for superficial reasons this way I can have my bookmarks always here and they're not actually taking up space that that bothers me uh, because the, the way it is by default it just does bother me so that Firefox CSS is a, a necessity for me when it comes to you know using Linux now obviously I could also do this on Windows and Mac OS if I was you know one of those people who used that so that's not uh, unique to Linux but because I discovered it on Linux I'm including in this list now the last one is the most nerdiest thing ever and it's going to be a little bit harder to explain because in order to understand it, you have to know what an environment variable is. So I've made a video, or really it was a short, a few weeks ago where I was talking about how I consider the home directory my personal property. I take full possession of my home directory and that means that when stupid developers, and I literally mean stupid developers, decide that they're going to put their applications configuration files into my home directory I get really seriously mad like borderline like insane because they do this like I'm very much protective over my home directory so when that happens I'm ecstatic to find a way to change that and one of the ways to change that at least in some cases is with an environment var variable so these things are cool and I'm not gonna cover everything that they can do because they can do a ton of stuff uh, but the thing that I enjoy about them is that they allow me to change stuff, change the place where the system expects certain directories to go. So, for example, by default, if you use ZSH, all of your ZSH stuff is in the home directory. It's, it's hidden, which is good, but it's in the home directory. I don't want that stuff there because it bothers my brain. It just I, I, I look at it every time I do an LS and I'm like... Mm. So I have to move it, and the way you move that is by setting an environment variable that tells the system, or in this case your shell, where those things are. So you do you do these certain environment environment variables and tell that it's going to be in the .config file or directory, and then you can move those things. So there are certain things you can't move, like you can't change the location of .zshn. That has to stay in your home directory. But everything else can go into the .config slash .zsh directory, and it's gone out of your home directory. Now, another example is Go. By default, when you install an application with the Go language, it, it puts a non-hidden directory in your home full, home directory. Like, it's there. It's just labeled Go. And whoever decided to design it that way just should stop being a designer or a developer. They should just stop and at least consider their life choices because that is a horrible decision. I'm just saying it right now. That thing should at least be hidden by default. I'll just hide it. I mean, at least hide it, but they know they didn't. But the good news is, with an environment variable, you can go through and change that. You can change the directory that Go expects your Go folder and where you know where it expects it to be. So, those are just two two examples. Now, this doesn't work for everything. So, if you install SnapD on your computer that didn't come with snapd installed by default you're going to get a very blatant snap folder in your home directory it can't be moved it doesn't matter what, what environment variables you set it can't be moved uh, so there are some exceptions to that rule and if you're interested in this in the environment variables that allow you to set different directories for things where they would normally be you can go to whatever project you're looking for and a lot of times you'll be able to see if they allow you to do that with an environment variable. So uh, that is environment variables. And like I said, it was very nerdy, not something everybody's going to be interested in. But and I wouldn't say it increases my productivity at all, but it doesn't it does lessen my stress every time I do an LS because I 
It, it it's one of those things that it just really bothers me when there's something in my direct my home directory that I didn't put there. It really bothers me. All right. So that is it for us this, on this video. You can, if you have things that have changed your life in Linux, you can leave those in the comment section below. Make sure you like and subscribe, all that stuff. I really do appreciate it. We're coming up on 6,000 subscribers, which is just seriously blowing my mind. I like, it was just like three days ago, it feels like that we're at 5,000 subscribers. It's just absolutely nuts. So thanks everybody who has subscribed over the last three weeks and before that, obviously, I really do appreciate it. If you want to get in contact with me, you can do so at the LinuxCast on Twitter. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to think of my current patrons. Devon, Chris, East Coast Web, Gen 2 is fun too. Patrick L, Primus, Marcus, Meglin, Jack Snape, Tool, Steve, A, Sid, A, Mitchell, Arch Center, Amateus, Merrick, Camp, Joshua Lee, J-Dog. Oh, I almost made it. J-Dog and the BSDs rock. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you next time.